Hallelujah. Put up your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. We're coming to the end of 2020. <laughs> I'm alive. I made it. In spite of what the devil says. Praise the Lord. Amen. We listen to him anyway. No, it's been great. And, and I, I was, I was, it's funny, I was getting ready to prepare a message for the last Sunday of the, of the, of the year. Coming in next week, we'll be coming into the new year. We're going to have a, a New Year's Eve uh, service, um, and, and so uh, you're welcome here in the church, but it will be open for live stream, if you, whatever you uh, prefer. Uh, the service is going to, well, we're going to, it's, it's going to be great. Praise the Lord. I'll share a word for what the uh, Lord is, is telling me for the next year coming up. Amen. And uh, so it's going to be a great celebration. So in preparing this message, I was looking back over the years, and kind of, uh, not living back there, like, you know, looking back and not plowing straight. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, recognizing what the Lord has brought us through. Sometimes we spend so much focus on getting through a problem that we forget that what the Lord has done in that problem That's to bring right. us through. Yes, sir. And we forget that. And we think, well, it was because of this circumstance or because of that circumstance. No, it's because of the hand of the Lord being upon us. If anything good has happened to you this year, you can guarantee God's signature is on it yes, sir. because Amen. the devil tried to kill, steal, and destroy every place we turn around and look. Uh, as we went through the pandemic, I mean, starting back in March when they started closing things down, uh, uh, you're talking nine months of this thing going through there, and it, it affected people's lives and jobs and everything else. The economy shut down. There was all, all these things that went with it. But I see it also through that. Uh, God has taken and, and, and uh, uh, magnified his word. He's encouraged people through their hearts, yeah. people of faith getting together and watching almost impossible situations, those they were, about impossible situations, turned completely around by the power of the Lord. Not only to mention his protection and all those other things. So I was thinking about this, and I mean, I, I, I can go all the way back to the first part of this year and just think, just this year alone, uh, I'm 69 years old, and I haven't seen some of the things we're seeing today in my 69 years of living. And I think my mom is 93. She can go back and say anything. I've, we haven't seen these things that are coming about either. But with all that, through the ages of whatever generation you are, the fact is God is bringing things to us, and he's prefer, preserving his church. Yes, Amen. So this is, this is really great. Now, we're, I said that he's preserving his church, but not for the church to sit uh, on a shelf in a jar. <laughs> you know, it preserves. All right, but... Well, okay. Praise the Lord. No, but for us to, to move forward into the next thing that he has for us. And he does. And I'm not just talking to us here in Key West. I'm talking to the church as a body across the world. And uh, so anyway, so I, I got thinking about this. So here's, here's what I came up with a title for. And, uh, and, and praying and, and thanking God for all the things. We, and, and, and here's the title that, that came to my heart. From Hard Pressed to Overcomer. Now, I get the word hard-pressed. I'll give you the scripture in a minute. I get that word from hard-pressed from Paul. If you want to be encouraged when you're going through problems, I recommend very highly to read Paul's accounts of the things that he went through. Okay, just, just read what he, what he has endured for the gospel's sake. And then he goes and he says, you know, all this stuff doesn't mean anything. What is important is God's work got done. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it was what well, I was working it done. And, but from hard-pressed to an overcomer, there's a process of time that takes place in there. How many know that? Uh, it's nice to say, it is, it is, and it, I've heard people say, well, pastor, that's easier said than done. Hey, let's face it, everything is easier said than done. Yeah. We say a lot of things. Right. Everything is easier said than done. But there, when, when a person gets a determination, here's what I'm going to, here's where the, be the gist of my message this morning. Find out from God what your purpose is on this, on this planet. Yeah, when you find that out, then focus completely on that. Make everything else that's attached to your life second place. Yeah. Put that one purpose forward, and then I'm going to give you some scriptures on it, but put one that purpose forward, and you'll have a direction. And not only that, you'll see life come to you. Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Yes. It's not what God has spoken to you that's necessarily making a difference in your life. It's what you obeyed when he spoke it to you. Yes. It's what you're acting on. It's what's spoken to you. Uh, I've seen scholars memorize whole books of the Bible, but not know Jesus, and it means nothing, really, until they have that relationship with Christ. And, and so anyway, uh, so from hard-pressed to overcomer, I get that word uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
And uh, verse 8, uh, this is this New King James uses that word hard pressed, hard hyphen, uh, uh, pressed. It says this. This is Paul writing to the church of, uh, of Corinth. And remember, the church of Corinth weren't going to accept him as an apostle. They said, what makes you an apostle, Paul? This is, the, this is the Corinthians. What makes you an apostle? You walk in here and start preaching. Who makes you an apostle? He says, and you think Paul would go back to his education, sitting under the uh, uh, Gamil and all his education. He, he come from a, a home of wealth. And he had all, every uh, college education, we would say today, uh, that you can think about. But he didn't. You know what he used for his qualifications as an apostle? I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been thrown in prison. And in other words, I have paid a price to present this gospel to you. Are any of you willing to go through what I've gone through to present the same gospel? Of course, he probably got a silent house at that point in time, and I think they were ready to listen to him. He said, no, okay. But he didn't use his education. He didn't use his uh, 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 titles. He didn't use any of the things that we would use today to impress people. He would say, no. He said, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. Uh, and you would think, okay, if you're going to share all that, does anybody really want to uh, do what you've done? <laughs> but they, the truth of the matter is they lined up because it was such a privilege to be able to serve God, even in hardship, it was such a privilege to serve God. I love Paul. I mean, I get a lot of encouragement from Paul reading his epistles and different things like that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 says this. He says, we are hard-pressed. That's where I get the thing of my title. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the scripture, 8 and 9. Then I'm going to go over it, and I'm going to break down each word and what it means a little bit. So I'll give you kind of a, 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 an amplified meaning, if you, if you will. But he says, he says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but yet not crushed. How is that possible? This is what, these are the things I was a- asking myself, asking the Lord. He says, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. He says, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Do you see where you have an attack, an attack, an attack, an attack, and then you have a response to the attack? Yeah, but it didn't work. Yeah, but this didn't happen. Amen. There's a nullification here. Nah, this was neutralized. So we see the plan of the enemy in this verse coming against Paul, for instance. You could put your name in there, coming against you. But then we come back and say, yeah, but we weren't, we weren't crushed. Amen. We weren't cast down. Yes, we're still here. Today we're looking so much at, at living in comfort that we think the worst thing in the world is, is to be under attack or, or, or persecuted for what we believe or for, persecuted for the message we share. And that isn't. Matter of fact, basically... basically it gives us opportunity uh, for, to see how God works. This is why I'm, uh, I'm pressing in this day and hour. I'm pressing. Get a personal relationship with God. Get into his presence. Yes, amen. Study the scriptures. What helps me a lot is studying the Psalms. Because uh, David's Psalms in particular. Because basically David, uh, say what you want about David, but he knew how to get in the presence of God. And he's the only man in the Bible that God used these words. He said, he's a man after my own heart. Praise the Lord. Do you remember when David was outside? He, he was getting back the Ark of the Covenant. He was establishing Jerusalem as, as, as God's city. Remember that? And they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. And the priests were carrying it on their shoulders. And they were sacrificing the lambs in front of it. And they were marching back to Jerusalem. And David was dancing. He threw his kingly robe off. His head, and he began to dance in the ephod. The ephod is a priestly garment. He said, I'm laying my king responsibilities aside and he just got involved in the and he's so happy to see the presence of God. That's what the Ark of the Covenant represented. It was the presence of God coming in that he was twirling about. He was doing all kinds of antics that a king doesn't normally do. Okay? So his wife began to laugh at him and mock him. But the fact is, I think, I think you really have to get involved to understand that. What she saw didn't make any sense because she wasn't involved in what he was involved in. So it, it takes an involvement with God. It takes an involvement uh, in the church to really get the depth. And people under, don't understand, well, why, why do you go to church so much? Why do you do this? You know, the world talks like that. And I said, well, why do you? well they, they can't get the concept because it looks foolishness to them. But the fact is, is it's, it's, you have to, I guess you've got to be involved to understand. Paul was involved. He had a mission. He knew his purpose. He knew exactly what he was on. Paul was the one invited. He knew, he knew when his mission was over. He said, okay, this is, I run my course. I, I run. He said, now I go to be, go, uh, I'm going home. So really the Romans didn't kill him until he was done. <laughs> that was it. So they basically held him prisoner 
I, I like, I just like, like listen to him. He said, we are, we are hard pressed. The word hard pressed, of course, means troubled. Some of your translations might have the word troubled. On every side, that means completely surrounded. We don't have a free side that isn't being attacked. Can you think about that? I don't know. I, mean, I, I think of all the, the attacks and stuff against you know, that we've gone through and all the hardships. At every side, I don't think we've seen every side uh, being under attack. There always seems to be one side that we can escape from. <laughs> but he said, no, on every side, but I'm not crushed. What happens? Think about this. I'm pressed on every side. To be crushed, that every side has to come in and tighten around like a noose around somebody's neck. But he said that didn't happen. In other words, I, I was surrounded, uh, I was hard pressed, and they're, they're pushing in or pressuring me, but no, I was never crushed. Amen. They couldn't do it. The enemy could not take it the next step further to crush me, is what he was saying. Even though he tried, even though he surrounded me, even though things looked bleak, he never could come in there and crush me. Yes, sir. Why? I believe Paul had a real clear vision of who he was and what he was doing on planet Earth. What, he, what his purpose was here. Amen? People think all their purpose is, well, I go to work, I make money, I come home, and I do this, and that's it. And, you know, and, and when I get a certain age, I'll just die, and that's all there is to it. I, I've seen, I think the real tragedy is not that some people die uh, at whatever age. I think the real tragedy is some people die and never know their purpose. Never know what they're on the planet for. But God has created you with a purpose from before you were in your mother's womb, he said to Jeremiah, and he created you with a purpose for this planet. And when we can focus on that, everything else in my life has become secondary. I still enjoy things. My wife and I, we will go on a vacation. Uh, I'll go scuba diving, different things like that. But you know, before I ever take a vacation or go anyplace, I always ask the Lord, I say, is this a good time? And then and when I get a yes, or that, but it never, nothing ever replaces what he's called me to do. It doesn't, I, don't, I don't find rest and insurance, though I like scuba diving. Scuba diving is my, my sport. I enjoy it uh, immensely. My wife, I'm thankful i got a wife that enjoys it too. Uh, we both do this thing together. But it never takes the place of what God has put personally. My purpose on this planet uh, that God has put me here for is to preach his gospel. <clears throat> Nothing will stop that. I, I will not put more attention into a pleasure or to a hobby than what God has called me uh, to do here on the planet. I believe Paul was this way, and I believe that was the key to his, uh, to his strength. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord, if not to his own success. To be crushed, what does it mean to be crushed? Not to be made narrow or, or compressed or cramped. You feel cramped by the enemy? How many, <laughs> how many people feel cramped by the enemy? Like, man, he just keeps squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. What next is going to happen? He keeps squeezing. Paul said, that's what I was going through on every side. But he said, they never crushed me. He never, he never was able to close in on me and crush me like a grape. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. So he, he couldn't do that. He said, then he, then he goes on, he said, we are perplexed. Well, the word perplexed means to have no way out. I, I, I cannot see a way out. This is impossible. I cannot see a way out. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Yeah. Just, my, yeah. just preaching here. Okay. Yeah. I cannot see a way out. He said, perplexed, to have no way out is what it means in the Greek. He said, but not in despair. Despair means to utterly, uh, to be at utter loss. He said, I never was at utter loss. Even though I was perplexed, it didn't seem like a possible way out. He said, I never was to the point where I was utterly lost. He said, I knew exactly where I was. I knew exactly what God had for me to do, and I pressed on. Is this helping anybody this morning? Uh, I'm breaking this down a little bit. I'll give you some more scriptures, but I want to, I want to get this across first because this is the first thing God gave me when I prayed for 2020. Well, uh, over, over what we're going through for 2020. This is what God puts, put in my heart. He says, he, he, he's, then he says, goes on to say, persecuted in verse 9. He said, persecuted, that's to be given to suffer. He said, I've been given to suffer. No, not given by God, given by the devil. The devil comes in and causes to still kill and destroy, as Jesus said. So, so he said, he says, but I, I've been persecuted. I, I've been uh, made a mockery because I stand for Christ especially around my Jewish brethren. He said, I, I, I've been made a mockery of this thing. He said, I've been, I've been uh, given to suffer. He said, but I'm not forsaken. The word forsaken means to be abandoned or to desert. He said, all this stuff, I have not been deserted. God has not abandoned me, and God has not deserted me. Now, this guy had success, so I want to, see, I want to, I want to read from somebody who's had great success. Not somebody who's failed or tried and it didn't work. I, I, don't, I don't want to hear that. I want, to, I want to talk to people who really have successful. Yes, sir. 
I want to talk to people in 2020 that have really gotten the true peace and have testimonies of peace of God in their heart. That's the one I want to talk to. Amen. I don't want to. I, I don't want to connect myself too much. Of course, I'm a pastor, so I have to. I pray for people, and we, I hear both sides of it. But the fact is, is, is I really like to get around people who have a positive attitude. We can do that. Amen. I used to. Tell, I used to require this in my leadership, and uh, years ago, I used to say, uh, if I ask you to do something, I said, don't tell me it's impossible. Yes, sir. So it might be. It might be. And or I used to say this. I said, if you don't have the answer, don't make something up. I said, just say, I don't know, Pastor, but I will find out. Amen. And in that searching out, because this, this is how I came into the kingdom, <laughs> okay? I don't know what that means, but I'm going to find out. And I'd be in the dig and dig and dig. And this is where God has exposed himself, amen, to, to, to me and where I found the presence of God. So this is what we used to do. Is that, and and, and the, the staff would kind of catch themselves. Say, what about this? Oh, I don't know. Oh, oh, but I will find out. <laughs> good save, good save. <laughs> we will find out. Praise the Lord. Because uh, I usually won't ask them unless I feel God's putting on my heart to live the answer. They've got the solution. They just have to hunt it out. Good. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. All right. Amen. Persecuted, not given this up, but not forsaken. Then, he, then the, here's the final one. I mean, this, he just has a list here. Struck down. Struck down to be thrown to the ground. That's what it means. To be struck down means to be thrown to the ground. Well, Paul can physically say, I've been thrown to the ground. It's not just a, 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 you know, a metaphor. I've been thrown to the ground. He says, but not destroyed. In other words, not, not in the word destroyed. Are you ready for this? This is the last, the last word. The word destroyed. He said, I, but I'm not destroyed. In other words, he said, I have not been rendered useless. Awesome. I'm going to say that again because this is powerful. I'm not destroyed. I've not been rendered useless. Come on, ask yourself, has the, all the, the stuff that's happened this year, has it rendered you useless in the house of the Lord? Has it rendered you useless as a, as a body of Christ? Come on, amen, Pastor. Hallelujah. Are you here? Okay, praise the Lord. I mean, you ask yourself the question. There's no judging here. But the fact is, 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 is he said, I was never rendered useless. I might have felt like, okay, you know, you're talking about a guy who was thrown in prison. And what did he decide to do when he, when he caught in prison? He said, well, okay, this is where, where we're at. He says, uh, Silas, look, let's sing a few songs. Uh, I imagine they were loud. I imagine the songs were obnoxious to whoever else but God. <laughs> and when he did, God began to send an earthquake and, and he shake that prison. Paul had enough wisdom not to walk out through the doors, and he had enough wisdom to tell him nobody else to leave either. Because God had something to... See, so how, many have, how many have run to his open door thinking, oh, God has set me free and missed the mark. But all the world open door is supposed to be a testimony so somebody else can get saved. Mm, praise the Lord. Amen? All right. Fear is a tool of the enemy to distract us from the thing, to distract us with a thing that is inferior. Whatever your fears, I understand something, your fear is inferior to your faith. It should be. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, so whenever the devil, he's, he uses a fear. And I, and I, and I love this. He, he, we, we were talking about this in the war room with the leaders. And uh, I, I went back and we were sharing about the, the devil. Uh, uh, I guess people in our leadership have been, have been criticized or, or, or uh, maybe got criticized, but just questioned uh, on why they go to church so much. How many ever had that? Yes, you don't understand it. Uh, but the thing is, is, you know, it's always, you go to church too much, people don't work too much, people don't eat too much, people don't play too much or recreation too much, but we go to church too much. Why is they single that out? Well, it's, it's the devil. The fact is, the devil wants to put doubt and unbelief in your heart, but he wants to attack it thing with fear. That's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to keep you from the purpose that God has created you for to start with. And so he'll throw so discouragement in there. Praise the Lord. This is a stinking devil. I understand something. The devil don't show up at your house in a red suit and horns and pitchfork. That cartoon devil, he would love to be presented that way, but he's not. He shows up like, uh, well, I'm not going to say amen, but he, I mean, he shows up like people. Amen? The spirit of darkness works through people. Amen? But God has given, I said, but God. But God. That just alleviates everything before that. But God has given us the power to break through that thing. Amen. 
So, but the fear of the enemy is to distract. And we were talking about this in the world. I see, how did, Jesus, how did the devil come to Jesus? He waited for him to get hungry from fasting, which Jesus did on his own. Okay, then he says, will you turn these stones into loaves of bread? Why? Because it's uncomfortable to be hungry. Come on, do I hear an amen? So what happens, he began to use a temptation with, and connect it to comfort. The second thing he began to do, he talked about the power or authority. That ministers to the pride, the human pride. So what he does is, so he said, well, if you bow down to me, he said, I'll give all these kingdoms to you. Jesus could have come back and said, they're already mine. Because the devil doesn't have anything to tempt you with except what God has given you. Amen. I said, the devil, hold on, I'm not to tempt you, but he'll use the things that God has given you. He'll pervert them like he did with Eve in the garden. And he'll pervert them and say, you know, well, if you take of this fruit, you'll be like God's. Got news for you, bucko. We are already. God has created us in his image. We are like in that image. So we don't have to take a fruit to become that. But we take the fruit, we become disobedient, don't we? And we become disobedient and all, of course, we all know the problems that have. We've been kicked out of the garden for years. It took Jesus' blood and sacrifice to bring us back in. Amen? Okay, this is my favorite. This is the fiesta result. This is this one right here. This, this is it. This is, the, this is the, 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 the prime rib of the whole message that I'm giving you this morning. Is Paul said this, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. And he said, I, I, I bolded it in my notes because I love this so much. He said, but none of these things Move me. How many have things move them? He said, none of these things move me. In other words, what does move you, Paul? He said, the Holy Spirit, his anointing, the purpose of God upon my life. That's what moves me. But none of these other things move me. Are you here? How many people have been moved by things? Oh, hallelujah. Where do we start? Amen. Amen. How many have been, been, been stopped? from growing spiritually because of what they've been moved in. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I got a revelation. Last night, my, my son and my daughter-in-law were down, and they took us out uh, to, to eat uh, brunch, I think, yesterday morning, uh, yesterday uh, around the noontime, and then we went out again last night. But what, uh, uh, what Eric and Elizabeth did, they set us up, and they, they took us on a trolley ride. Uh, not a trolley, sorry, the, the train, the contour train. And if you know Key West... Now, you people live up north, they're going to laugh, but it was cold in Key West. <laughs> I mean, when it gets down 60 degrees, and I know all, all the people in Michigan, all over the place, are all laughing. Really? We call that summertime. Uh-uh, yeah, well, take 60 degrees and raise, raise the humidity about 80% and see what you say. <laughs> it's cold, I don't care what you do. And we're, So we all get on the trolley, but the thing, uh, the, the t- uh, contour train, but we get on the train and we get in a, in, in all these other people, and all we do is ride around and we look at Christmas lights. It's kind of fun. They play Christmas music, and it was really cool. And, and Eric and Elizabeth wanted to do that for us. So we, we were having fun, and, and we're shouting at people. And say, and say, and just kind of, but the thing is, and Key West and the rules is you've got to be, even outside, you've got to wear a mask. So I figured, I got a, I got a new mask for Christmas that Levi gave me, and it has a shark on it. It's really cool, I think. It, and I noticed when I opened up the package that there were, there, 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 it has the inserts to put in there, in the mask. So I'm wearing my mask and my black. Well, I had to run to the car for something. I came back, and all of a sudden, <sighs> I'm out of breath. I said, like, what is it? I'm pulling out the mask, like, <sighs> trying to breathe. Well, I didn't know what was going on. I got home last night, and I opened, it, opened up the mask and looked at it. And you know those filters you put in? I had two of them together. <laughs> I was protected from the COVID. I got news for you. Don't protect. But, but breath, taking a breath was an effort. So I slipped out one of those filters, and it was fine. Wasn't nothing wrong with the, with, with the gift. There was nothing wrong with the mask. It was the misuse of it. It was used, uh, what we usually say here is, 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 is operator problem. Error. error. Operator errors. See, they can recite that back to me. Hallelujah. Operator error. But none of these things move me. Do, do I count my life dear unto myself? Read the rest of the verse. So that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry that I, which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ I t- t- to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Hallelujah. I said before, I said the power of the gospel is for the world to turn to Christ. The rapture is about the church. If you're only looking for a rapture, you're missing, you're missing the mark. Now, the rapture is going to happen, but there's no man knows. Why does no man know the day of the hour? Because God didn't want you focused on that. He kept it for him. He, I'll, I'll tell you what, when it's going to happen, and nobody else will. 
He said, but, but the power of the gospel, he says, you go out and preach the gospel. Jesus told his disciples, go out and preach the gospel to every living creature. Now, creature doesn't mean bugs. In, 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 uh, uh, creature means is every nationality, creed, color, religion, everything, all people, yes, sir. to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen? So, this, this is, so this is what was the understanding. Uh, and, and he says, it, preach the gospel to every living creature. So this is the power of the testimony of Christ is in the gospel. The power that we have given to us is in the Gospels. Praise the Lord. And, uh, anyway, praise the Lord. The focused life is a life that understands why they are here. Plain and simple. I said this before. I said the focused life is a life that understands why we're here and having a greater understanding of God's purpose. Amen? Amen. Now, how many, how many of you, well, you all, did you all view the, 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 the Christmas Eve service we had? Now, what I did, I let the staff do the whole, put, put on the whole production. And I said, I'll MC it or tell me what you want me to do. I said, so what I was doing, they, they said, well, why don't you close it out, Pastor? I said, fine, it would be great. So I was sitting home and I just put together a little message. I wasn't, it wasn't going to be a long sermon because we were just closing it out. And uh, so uh, I'm sitting here and, uh, and then we went down and, of course, Jason and, 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 and Jeff and, and, and all of them had something to say. And they put it, and Saray was getting put together. And then Jennifer gets up, Okay. Jennifer, my secretary, gets up and she starts preaching this message. And it was the exact same thing that I had prepared <laughs> to speak. <laughs> oh, pastor, I'm so sorry. No, don't be sorry. This is good. I said, the fact is, I said, you've been listening to some things. <laughs> back years ago, this is, this is how, when I got into the mission, I'm going to just go back 33 years ago. I came out of religion. The last thing I wanted in my church is religion. You know, a, a form and a format of doing something with no life, no, no reason to do it, just do things habitually. I had to have a reason for everything we did. I had to have a biblical reason for everything that we did. And so, I would, so then we come to Christmas time. Now, Christmas time, you think, well, this is the pastor can just unloose. No, no, Christmas time, you understand, Christmas time, people are expecting a certain things. We would see people in the church we wouldn't see all year long. Well, I got one message to hit these people with. It's got to be a good one. The fact is, it can't be some tradition. And I, so I started studying the Lord and I started asking the Lord. And what he did, he pulled out two people of the Bible that are both the biggest unsung heroes in the Christmas story you've ever heard about. And it was Anna and Simeon. Yeah. Anna and Simeon. How many are there? Well, you've heard of them if you come here. How many are Anna and Simeon. What was so special about Anna and Simeon? Oh, man, where do I start? The account is in Luke chapter 2. But it, was, it, it says, I'll, I'll just read the, the 25th verse. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And he was a man, uh, uh, this man was just and devout. Waiting for the, listen to this. This is the word that was used for the Messiah. This is what the scriptures say. The consolation of Israel. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means the Messiah. Like, so uh, Simeon, being a prophet, already uh, uh, magnified the fact that Jesus was going to be the Messiah. Or is the Messiah? Not going to be, is. Okay, is the Messiah. Okay, the consolation of Israel. Israel believed that when the Messiah comes, he would console them of all their problems and all their... This is what they believed. As Simeon was, was dedicated to the temple, and, he's, and this is what it says. It says, he waited for the, cons uh, the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, it didn't dwell in him like we do because it, the pour, outpouring didn't happen yet. But the fact is that the Holy Spirit was upon him and as it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, so this is a revelation, that he would not see death before he had seen the, the, the Lord's Christ. Can I give you an example of a man who is strictly focused? Amen. Because what happens... He was waiting. To, no, as God says, you, you can, when you lay your physical eyes upon this Messiah, you can depart and come on home. Amen. So it meant him dying in this life and going home as soon as he saw Jesus. Not that much you probably got from Jennifer. But, the, the, but, but uh, I told her, I, said, uh, I always have one or two revelations in the back there. We, I, I can pull myself up and out with but I said, I didn't. I just closed it. But anyway, uh, so... Uh, is what happened? Now, let's get the picture of this. Simeon, dedicated to a temple, dedicated to prayer, Holy Spirit speaks to him, and now they bring Jesus in. Now, remember, out of mouths of two or three witnesses, let be were established. Anna was a woman who was a widow. 
and she had been married to the guy about seven years from her virginity, the Bible says. Seven years, she's married to this guy. So some scholars believe, because the Bible says she was 84, 84 years she served in the temple. She could be over, almost 100 years old. Still served. Never left the temple. I don't know how they did it. Were they sent out for food? Uh, Uber Eats? I don't know what they had back then. But, the, but she never left the temple. She prayed, and the Holy Spirit came on her and identified Jesus the ba as a Messiah. Now think about this. You're a Jew under Roman oppression. You're just looking for freedom because you have none. Uh, you're looking for, for uh, uh, the blessing of the Lord, waiting patiently for the blessing of the Lord. You, you get the promise of the scriptures that Jesus is going to show up. And all of a sudden, here comes Mary and Joseph into the temple. Now this, was, this would have been 40 days after Jesus' birth in, in Bethlehem. Because Mary brought her offering of purification. That had to happen 40 days after she gave birth. Two turtle doves. Amen? Turtle dove is a common offering and, 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 and for one thing. And the second uh, meaning of a turtle dove is for sin offering. So she, it was required of the law to, for purification. So she's presenting herself for purification. So Jesus was 40 days old or a little over a month old. So basically, so they have this baby. And Simeon's there, and she hands, he takes the child to, for, for dedication, kind of like we do child dedication here. And when he took the dedication, the Spirit of the Lord, he said, this is the Messiah. He wasn't handed, he wasn't a, a full-grown man that walked through the door, dressed in armor and ready to take over and, and, and free Israel of, of Rome. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't this man of great statue that had an army behind him, ready to come in and free the people. It wasn't, it wasn't that at all. It was a baby. He was so focused on the plan, so focused on what he was supposed to do, that all he had to see was that baby. He says, now I can, be, I can depart in peace. Thank you, Lord. I can now depart in peace. I've laid my eyes upon him. He didn't have any other confirmation. That was it. And Anna basically said the same thing. We've, we've seen the Messiah. We've seen the, counselor, uh, uh, the consolation of Israel so is right here. Now, if Anna is in the temple, she served 84 years. How many babies do you think she saw in her lifetime? She didn't leave the temple. So every baby that come into that temple in Jerusalem, she saw it. Maybe had a part in it. But this one child, the one thing that's special, hang on to that thought. The one thing that you need, the one thing that can set you free, that's what you need to understand. That one thing. God's not going to come into many things. There's that one thing that we're going to look for. Amen. There's one thing that we need to, if we look back over the year, what is the one thing that was, that was that's prevalent in, in 2020? And don't tell me the pandemic. And, and No, what was the one thing how God blessed us and preserved us all through this year? Amen. That one thing is the key to his truth. Amen. You are trying to fix all the problems in your life, and I'll bet you if I, in a few hours of counseling, I could tell you there's one thing. If you focused on that one thing, you'd be free. See, we're looking to quit this habit and quit that habit, and we're looking to, 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 to uh, what's it, oh yeah, New Year's resolutions, how they work. New Year's lies more like it. <laughs> yeah, we just tell the truth for a while, we lie. One thing, I bet there's one thing I could go around, around the room, one thing in your life, if you were to change that one, it would be like flipping a switch. All of a sudden, your entire life would change. It's not the multitude of, of, of entanglements and, 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 and unforgiveness and those things that the play. I'm not speaking that down. But there's one thing that causes all of those other things. One thing. You find that one thing, and I can almost guarantee you freedom. That's if you act upon it. Find that one thing and change it in your life. That one thing. And now it, I'm gonna, it's, not, it's not necessarily a habit. It's not a task or anything. But one thing. Because I, I know how the Lord works. One thing. Now, God has had me do many things over the years in ministry uh, and in my personal life. But it came down to one thing. And the Lord, it spoke to me. I had all, I mean, I had all kinds of problems. I had anger issues. I had, all, you know, I had a temper. I mean, it was all kinds of problems I had in my life. I could, could the people say, well, control your temper. Okay. Then don't be stupid. It ticked me off. <clears throat> always, always, it's always the other person's problem, right? Uh, and, uh, or I would use this. Hey. I'm Irish. <laughs> what are you supposed to have? You know, stubbornness and temper. That's what the Irish people want. So, no, God says, that's not it at all. He said, it's not your, in your heritage. It's not even in your DNA. He says, listen, he, he says, change the one thing. The one thing for me, 
was listening to Christ and making him Lord over my life. What does that mean? See, a lot of people make him Savior, but that sounds the same as making him Lord. Christmas time, we see the little baby. I mean, all, all Simeon had to do was see the baby, and he saw the Messiah. He didn't see a baby. Though he had a baby in his hands, he didn't see a baby. He saw the deliverance of Israel. He saw, and this is what Simeon said. He said, not only for, he, he said, let me go ahead and read, read the rest of it. He said, the counsel of Israel was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until Christ came. Listen to this. He says in verse 32, uh, this is 232. He said, a light to bring revelation. Listen to this. This, this, is, this is a Jew. But listen to what he says. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people Israel. Amen. He had the whole package. Amen. Many of the Jews thought, okay, Jesus, just for the Jews, that was all there was to it. But no, no. He said, no, this is also, he said, a revelation to the Gentiles. That one thing, if I'm talking to a Gentile, that one thing, get a revelation of Jesus Christ and all your other things can change. Amen. That's if you're serious about change. Yeah. But if you're not serious about change, then none of the things I'm telling you are going to be applicable. Right. You have to be serious about the change. Well, I'm preaching better. I'm getting response to this morning, but hallelujah. Amen. Glory. So, amen. How many has ever heard of a person in the Bible by the name of Micaiah. Micaiah? Nobody? Oh, good. <laughs> it is in the Bible, by the way. I was looking at this. This is one of these things that about a week or so ago, I woke up, and, and, and God put Micaiah on my heart. I don't know why. And uh, so I started looking at it. So it was, I, I passed it up last week. I said, uh, and, and again this week, in prayer, he was, he was bringing out Micaiah. So I think this is going to help you. But in 1 Kings, chapter 22, verses 5 and 6, now, you're going to think these are unrelated uh, bits and pieces. I'm going to tie it all together, so just be patient. Praise the Lord. It's coming. Uh, 1 Kings 22, 5 and 6, it says, uh, it talks about Jehoshaphat. Well, let me, give you, let me back up the story. 1 Kings, chapter 22, you can always find, you can find the same account in 2 Chronicles, chapter 18. How many remember Ahab and Jezebel? Nobody? How many remember Ahab and Jezebel? Is this, is this is my mic okay? Can you come across? Okay, sound, sound guy? Okay, all right, sorry. Okay, you all heard of Ahab and Jezebel. What happened in, in, in the kingdom after Solomon split? So you had the northern kingdom, which was Samaria, okay, or Israel, and you had the second, they had the, the southern part was uh, Judah or Judea. So that was the land of Judea. They had two separate kings. Ahab and Jezebel were just, they were just, they were evil. That's all there was to it. And because of their evilness, uh, uh, Samaria always seemed to be under oppression by the enemy, which was the Syrians. So what happens, Ahab's got this idea. He said, if I can just remove the Syrians, if I can just kill them, they'll leave me alone and I can take over their property. In other words, they're, they're living in our land. I'm taking our land back. It's, you know, he made it sound noble. <clears throat> but he says, I can't do it by myself, so I'm going to rely upon the Abrahamic covenant that I have with Jehoshaphat, who's king over Judah. But I just have to convince Jehoshaphat to help me out in this endeavor that will benefit me. <laughs> Sound like a business deal you've been associated with? All right. So anyway, this is, what, so this is how it goes. So Ahab puts on the whole thing. They get at the, at the open gate of the Samaria, and they set up two thrones, one for Je Jehoshaphat and one for, for Ahab. And Ahab has 400, amount is 400 prophets to come out because he says, uh, Hosphat says, before we en engage in the battle, he says, I want to hear from the, uh, I want to hear from the Lord. I want to hear what the Lord says about this. So she says, okay. He says, uh, so he's got 400 prophets there and they all prophesy one after another. And Jehoshaphat sits there thinking, I'm thinking he, he probably has an idea that Ahab's trying to pull something on him. So he says, is this all you have in Israel for the voice of the Lord? He said, is there not, not, is there not one, one prophet in Israel? Now, this is in the time of Elijah and Elisha, so evidently they weren't in Samaria at the time this happened because the only one could come up with was Je uh, uh, Ahab. But Jehoshaphat wouldn't take uh, uh, no for an answer. I want to hear from somebody else beside these 400 guys, probably on the payroll. I said, no, I want to hear a true word of the Lord. So they dig this guy out of prison. 
I'm guessing he was chained and blindfolded. I'll share that why, why I think that. Anyway, they bring him in front of the two kings, and he says, um, he, he, Ahab makes this comment to, to Jehoshaphat, and he says this. He says, uh, yeah, there's one prophet, Micaiah, uh, but he never prophesies anything good about me. And Jehoshaphat said, don't say that. He said, because that could be a one true word of the Lord, and you're rejecting it already before we can get him out here. See what he says. So they get Micaiah out of prison. <laughs> I love this guy. This guy has a small part in the Bible, but oh, what's such a big impact. But he comes out, and he, they, they, they got him bound, I think. Because, uh, I'll share in a minute why I think that. And I think he's blindfolded. But anyway, he, they bring him out there, and they say, okay, here's Micaiah, prophet. He says, okay, prophesy the word of the Lord. So what Micaiah does, he mimics the 400 prophets. That, and right away, Ahab knows he was, just, he, he was mocking him, is what he was doing. <laughs> Can you imagine being a prisoner and mock these other guys? But he was mocking them. So they basically said, no, you prophesy the word of the Lord. He says, okay. He said, and this is the word of the Lord. He's I'm going to prophesy the word of the Lord to you. He says, I saw Israel scattered. This is in Kings 22, 17. I saw Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep with no shepherd. That would be Ahab. <laughs> he said, and the Lord said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Amen. With all of Ahab's influence to tilt the scales the other way, he could not, he could not change the word of the Lord. So right away, uh, there was another prophet within the 400. It was named, his name was uh, 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 Zedekiah. Zedekiah comes up and punches him in the face. And, so, and then he asks him, he says, well, prophet of the Lord speak. Where did that come from? So I, I got the idea that he was blindfolded. He couldn't see it coming and probably changed so he couldn't fight back. And he, so, he told this to, to Zedekiah. I love it. He says, he says, when you're in your hiding, you'll know. In other words, that, w- that was going to be, you're going to be hunted as a false prophet after you got done with this thing. But it, it, it stands to reason, one man, one man. Remember I said there's that one thing. Yes, one man against 400. Amen. And basically, he had the one true name of the Lord. What turned out to be, and it goes on, you can read it. He says, oh, uh, in, in 2 Chronicles 18, I like this, in, in verse 26, it says, Thus saith the king, talking about Ahab. This is his response to, uh, um, uh, um, to the prophet. He says, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I return in peace. But, but Micaiah said to him, he says, he says, he says If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken to me. <laughs> He said, take heed, all you people. Yes. <clears throat> what happened was the, uh, uh, Ahab didn't tell Jehoshaphat. Ahab had already heard that the Syrians had a hit squad out for him. They had a squad of people that were supposed to assassinate him. Right here. Yes, so what he did, he dressed himself in common armor and not his kingly robe, but he told Jehoshaphat, you go out there and sit on the mountain, on the top of the mountain, and dress in your kingly attire, and you stand there and observe the battle from your highest point. Well, Ahab snuck in with the group. Though the hit squad comes out, they, they, they're, they're coming after the, the king they see up on the hill, and they get close to him, and they say, wait a minute, this isn't Ahab, and they turned around and <laughs> left him alone. They turned around, and they found Ahab within the, in the mix, and they killed him on the spot. What's the, what's the moral here? What's, what's the point, Pastor? The thing is, is the one true thing that we need, that one thing that we need from God is the truth. Amen, Whether we want to hear it or don't want to hear it. Yeah. Amen? A lot of times our sinful nature does not want to hear what God has to say. But it's that one thing that can save your life by listening to the, to the account of God. It's that one thing. Uh, well, Micaiah went back to prison, but I, I dare to say that he didn't stay there long. <laughs> Because basically Ahab never returned again. He was killed on the Gilboa. Uh, uh, and, and, because Syria was coming in and pressing in. They took over a few, few towns and different things like that. And uh, it made, made Ahab mad. Ahab had the idea that he could get whatever he wanted. Uh, by hook or crook, he was going to get anything he wanted. But he, but, but, now, listen to this. Ahab was not ignorant of God's word. Ahab knew that Micaiah, as soon as he was brought out, he was going to get a true word of the Lord. There was no de- debate in it, and, and, and Ahab knew that. But he had so set on his way of doing things, so set on what he wanted, that his will uh, through the Satan had overpowered the right thing to do. 
That one thing, all he had to do is switch that one thing. All he had to do is say, you know what, Micaiah's right. He said, we'll, we'll, well, let's end this campaign. But now even set, the guy who asked, he asked to help set him up as a patsy to get killed at his place. Just anything that he could win because it was his will, not God's will. Anything that he could do to get his will done over God's will, he would have done it. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen. But the, one, but the thing that has not changed and will never change is the one true word of God. Yeah. That, that did not change. It still stands. That's exactly how it came out, exactly how uh, Micaiah says it. Yes, we hear a lot of times people talk about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Uh, I have a fear of the Lord. But when we use the word fear, because then we go over to, to, to uh, the, the epistles and we say, well, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power of love and a sound mind. Do you know there's a difference, there's a difference in context in the fear of the Lord? Yeah. Yes, but if you write this, jot this scripture down, because basically this will tell you the difference. Uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. New King James Version. Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 5. Now listen to this. It says, My son, if you receive my words and, the treasure, and treasure my commandments within you, so that you incline your ears to wisdom. Mark that. Incline your ears to wisdom because there's a lot of fools that are talking. Amen, the world is full of foolish ideas and foolish notions. Uh, but, he said, but he said, incline your ear. I'm giving you some, some how-tos here this morning. Amen. Amen. But in, incline, your, uh, incline your ears to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver, talking about discernment uh, uh, and understanding, if you seek her with silver and search her as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and what else? And find the knowledge of God. Amen. So what does it take to get that one thing that will turn things around and, and, and Go, we're, now remember, we're going from, from, uh, uh, we're going from the, the uh, uh, hard-pressed to the overcoming. How many, want, how many people want to, hear, want to hear, be an overcomer? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Raise your hand if you want to be an overcomer. Amen. Do you realize what Jesus did? You mean you're going to overcome problems. Yes, sir. <laughs> it takes a problem. It takes a tribulation to be an overcomer. You've got to have something to overcome to be an overcomer. I heard a preacher say a long time ago, but the fact is that you've you got to have something to overcome. So basically, yeah, I want to be an overcomer. Why? Because problems are a part of life. But the fact is, if I could be an overcomer, I can raise above the problem. Praise God. Amen. Now, ask yourself this. I'm not allowed, but ask yourself this. What am I willing to do to be an overcomer? What am I willing to change, give up, or embrace, whichever the case may be? I said, what, what is it that one thing that I could hit the nerve of my problem and change, and am I willing to do it? Or does the affliction or the problem uh, become more of a God than he does? Just a question. I'm not, not, not condemning anybody, nor not pointing fingers, I don't, don't judge, but just think about it. Is, your, is, is the problem that you have becoming your God? Is the problem you have telling you who and you who will not serve, what you'll do and what you won't do? Amen? Because that's the question we all have to answer for ourselves because basically it puts itself ahead of God's righteousness and the plan that he has for us. One of the things that helps with that is the fact is singling down and knowing I'm here on this planet. I may not know all the exact details. Um, I mean, uh, Micaiah, he didn't have all the exact details and how, 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 he didn't prophesy all the details on how Ahab was going to die. He just knew he wasn't going to come back in Samaria. It was going to be the end of it, and Israel was going to be without a, without a shepherd, which was the, the, a leader. He knew that. It didn't give all the details, well, you're going to go here, and you're going to do this, and, it's, it's, and they're, going to, they're going to shoot an arrow. It's going to get between your armor. It's going to kill you. And there's all this other. He said, no, he didn't, he didn't go through all that. Matter of fact, he, Ahab, right up to the end, wanted to be a deceptor because he was shot in the chest uh, underneath the armor. And he said to the guy, prop me up. That was make me look alive. Hello. Make me look alive. So uh, the enemy doesn't, so the enemy thinks that they lost. Make me look alive. And he, and, and he wound up dying anyway. But, you know, prop me up. Don't let, don't let the enemy see me die. They, so, but he set his own doom by refusing the word of the Lord. He set his own demise 
Going into battle without the word of God. Going into this fight without knowing God and, and, and the purpose of God. One man stood against 400 to bring the truth. One man stood against 400 to, to, to bring the truth. Amen. Are you here? Yes, sir. God always has somebody that will stand up and tell the truth. Amen. Do you remember uh, what it, uh, Elijah was running from uh, Jezebel because Jezebel threatened to kill him? And he ran and ran and ran, and of course he ran out of energy, and he was laying there, and he was moaning to the Lord. He says, he says uh, there, Jezebel wants to kill me, and I'm the only prophet left uh, in, in all of Israel, and, and so on and so forth. And God said this to him. He says, i got 7,000 that have, about, have not bowed their knee to Baal. We look at the situation, we think there's shortage after shortage after shortage. God says, no, nah, i got 7,000 I can bring forward any time. God is never in a deficit. We do not have any influence, or, or, or uh, not influence, but we don't have anything to say about a move of God. We, we can't stop a move of God. We can't start a move of God unless he wants it. This is his will. Amen? But all you can do is stop your involvement in it. That's all you can do. You can't stop a move. God, move of God is going to happen. Listen, rapture is going to happen. Uh, uh, revival is going to happen. Uh, uh, you can't stop it. Uh, the devil can't stop it. The government can't stop it. The only thing you can stop is your involvement in it if you so choose. Yes, Praise the Lord. Yes, but I sir. truly believe that we're living in the hour of the ten virgins. I'm not going to preach on that this morning, but that's a whole other message in itself. But the uh, message of ten virgins. The thing is, which five do you want to be? Amen. Which group of five do you want to be included in? That's the question to ask yourself. That might be the one thing. If we get that straightened out and, 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 and go to get... What, it's amazing because the, the, the foolish said to the wise, says, we're running out of oil, our lamps are going out, give us of your oil. And for the first time you heard the church say no. No, we're not giving, because if we give you our uh, reserve, we won't have enough. Amen. So instead, go to where they buy and sell oil. Where is that? I'm thinking about this scripture the other day. Where is that? Oil, we know, is an anointing of God of the Holy Spirit, Correct. So where do you go to get the anointing of God and the Holy Spirit? Kmart? No, Kmart's going out of business. Sears already did go out of business here in Key West. So, so where, where do you buy this oil? TJ Maxx? I don't know. You, you know if you shop there, I don't know. Uh, Ross? You may get a discounted price. But I, now where do you get this oil? There's only one place. It's in a fellowship of believers. And the oil that you need for this is why the preaching and, 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 and the anointing is shifting towards not how to survive, how to overcome. Hallelujah. Praise Amen. God. Paul did not have the idea of survival. He had the idea of being an overcomer. Amen. I like that. He didn't just look survival mode while, you know, I'm beat up. God will protect me. He'll heal my body. I mean, the guy is shipwrecked. He gives a command. Uh, the, the captive, uh, which is Paul, be, uh, the prisoner, becomes the commander of the ship. He says, don't leave the ship and no life will be lost. So the ship is falling apart in the storm. And, and, and they're buying, trying to put cords around the ship and hold the ship together. And he says, don't leave the ship, no life will be lost. He, so he saves the entire crew at his command and everything else. And while he's washed up on the beach with the rest of them, he goes and he starts to gather some wood to dry out their clothes and stuff you know, to, to, to warm up on, uh, to build a fire. And he reaches in and he gets bit by a viper. Not, he said, that's not a bad day. I don't care. Anyway, said, that's a bad day you're having. I mean, first of all, you're shipwrecked. You, didn't, you told them not to leave the port to start with, that they're going to run into a storm and disaster, but they didn't listen to you. So then they get out there so you can fast and pray so you can have a word from the Lord to save their life. And they didn't want to listen to that, but they finally listened to it. And then what happens is the ship comes apart anyway, but it comes apart closer to the shore to where you can float up on the beach. So he saves the life of everybody. And what happens? Then I go reach to get wood to help everybody else, to comfort everybody, and I'm bit by a viper. He's shaken off in the fire. Of course, God saved them from the poison. And this is a, that's a bad day. We would look at that as a dead, bad day. Why? Because everything was discomfort. But Paul wouldn't. He wouldn't look at it as a, a bad day. He said, I just had the opportunity to share the power of God like nobody has on this planet. He says, I overcame death. How many times? Overcame. He said, because of power. But he said, I witnessed to all the people on that boat. Now, all of a sudden, the ones that were scared, the seagoing captains and stuff that were scared, were asking him for advice. What should we do? What should we do? Don't leave the ship. No life will be lost. Don't leave the ship. No life will be lost. Amen? 
And they, and they followed Paul. They followed the, the, the word of a Jewish prisoner. Think about that. A Roman followed. They had to be scared. That, that, was, a, that was a point of desperation. But they followed the word of a Jewish uh, 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 prisoner. Yes, sir. And the prisoner, be, the captive became the commander. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Help anybody this morning? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says in, in uh, and where was it? No, this one, one, one. Um, I'm picking stuff out of my notes. I'm hand-picking this morning uh, to, to bring it back. In this, uh, um, where was it? It's Romans. Um, here it is. Romans 10, 17. You should be familiar with this script. I should just mention it. But it says, Romans 10, 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. How many know that scripture? Yes. So faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. Faith does not come by, I heard. The scripture does not say, it came because I heard. It doesn't come by, I heard. Well, yeah, I know, I, I went to Sunday school, and, and yeah, I heard it years ago. No, 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 it says it comes by hearing. Hearing means a continuation. I hear it, I hear it, I hear it, and hear it. Somebody asked me one time, so, Pastor, why do you keep repeating messages? So that was years ago. Uh, I said, because you didn't get it the first time. I said, well, we're going to keep on repeating it until you get it. Amen. Well, we, we want some bigger revelation. I said, well, move on to that when you get this one. <laughs> That's about, about what it was like. The fact is, no, no. Faith comes by hearing. Faith is what we need to please God. Faith comes by hearing, not by I've heard. Amen. Not, not with the attitude, well, you can't tell me anything. Oh, I've seen this all before. Yeah. Paul didn't. The apostles didn't see all this before? Huh? All, all brand new to them? No, they walked in it. They walked in it. Praise the Lord. They watched Jesus, and they watched Jesus, and they watched Jesus. When it came to their time where Jesus sent them out two by two to minister, they came back and had great success in deliverance, great success in ministry, but the wrong character. I said they had great success in ministry, but the wrong character. And they were rebuked. So what does Jesus do? He turns around and gets 70 more that are less experienced, <laughs> that weren't walking with him at all, like the 12, and he used them. Why? Because he wasn't looking for the experience. He was looking for the faithfulness. Amen. Jesus wasn't looking for how many times you heard something. Amen. It's not, a, it's not a, a number we stick on our refrigerator, how many times you heard something. No, no, he says to continue hearing and hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing. What are we hearing? What are we listening to? Because that's going to determine what faith we're having in, into. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. I mean, you're not going to feed off of, off, off of medical stuff and, and medical ideas and, and every commercial that, that, that says you've got this problem, that problem, the other problem, try to diagnose you over the television set. You're going to listen to all that and all of a sudden believe God for healing. You can't immerse yourself into the social media. And there's nothing wrong with, this, with the thing I'm saying. But you can't immerse yourself in that and push aside your Bible, and forget about the Word of God. Then have the strength in the last days to survive, or, the, or, or not survive, become victorious. Amen. You're not going to have it. Why? Because basically you're, you're, you're sabotaging the faith that God has given you already. You're sabotaging the gift that God has given you. Oh, okay. Is, is there an amen in this, in this yes. morning? Yes. So amen. the one thing, what's that one thing? To switch us, that one thing to make us uh, uh, hard from hard-pressed, we're moving from one place to another. We're moving from hard pressed to an overcomer. Yeah. An overcomer yes. is victorious. How many problems? What have I prophesied and said? Everybody in this church is going is, is, is to win nine out of ten battles. All right? Okay, you're all going to win nine out of ten battles. You're going to ask, what are you going to ask me? Which one? <laughs> what about the other one? <laughs> You got focus. Why? Because you want to win 10 out of 10. How many want to win 10 out of 10 battles? Right. If I was to say it that way, it's just, just an example. But is it, no, uh, uh, 9 out of 10. No. How, okay. Uh, uh, let's say 9 out of 10 and a half. <laughs> or, or 9 and a half, I should. 9 and a half out of 10. 9 and a half? Oh, ha well, what about the half of what it be? I couldn't get that. I got all these, but I couldn't get that half? See, this, that, that you get any idea. Faith comes by hearing, not heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing again. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same way. In the Greek, it's continuous. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not narrowed down to an event. It is something that's exercised over and over and over again. Praise the Lord. How many got something on this message this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. 
I got more scriptures, but I think if you, if you chew on these for a while, you'll, you'll, you'll get something. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we've covered, let's see, we covered Paul, we covered uh, Micaiah, uh, we covered what it takes. How do I know the difference of the fear of the Lord? How do I get the fear of the Lord? The biblical fear, not the afraid kind of fear, but the biblical fear through understanding and wisdom. The understanding of the Lord. So how do we get the understanding and the wisdom from God? You, you have a relationship with Him. You hear by the Holy Spirit, you let Him speak to your heart. Hallelujah. Amen? If you don't know how to speak to your heart. Uh, here's the, I, I hear, uh, let me take the Christian angle first. Uh, the Christian angle says this, well, I, I haven't heard from God in years. Have you ever heard from him? Oh, yeah, but I haven't heard from God in years or maybe months or maybe weeks. I don't want to go one day without hearing him. But, the, but you know, I don't, is it possible? Just think about this. Is it possible? that you didn't do the last thing he told you. Because if God has already spoken what for your next direction, then that's all he's going to speak. The silence of the Lord may be because you didn't act on what he said, or maybe, maybe not. I mean, you judge this for yourself. There's no judgment here. Uh, but, this, uh, but how many would like to have fixed some problems? Oh, I love wisdom. I mean, people give me wisdom. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll sit there and, and suck it up like a sponge. Amen? Yeah. Then there's the person who doesn't know Christ, the person who never made a, a, a Christ their Lord, Jesus their Lord. I don't hear from God. Oh, well, there is one voice that you can hear, but it's going to be the voice of salvation. And that's the words God's going to use. And if you continually put him down, put him down, put him down, put him off, well, I'll do that someday. Or if you got the foolish idea that, well, uh, uh, all he's talking about is going to church services every Sunday. Now, that's not salvation. That's religion. Yeah. Amen? We don't go to church service because we're, we, uh, we accept the salvation. We go to accept church service because we love Christ. Yeah. Amen. And we want to follow his word. Amen. I've heard people say this. I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, isn't the church and everybody, we're, we are the church. Good. You're absolutely right. Jesus Christ died for his church. He died, died for people, not a building. That's what he, how he died for but on the other hand, if you are his church, you are not his Lord. You don't tell him what you want to do or what you're going to do. You ask him what he wants you to do. And that's the difference. Maybe that's the one thing. I'm throwing out, I'm throwing out ideas here this morning. If, you want, if you're really interested in, in changing your life and changing it for the good. If you're really interested, I'll throw it out there. So you, you can grab what you, what you think you need. But I know one thing. If you keep a, a, a constant relationship with him, I hear God, I hear God speak every day. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it's instruction, sometimes it's just fellowship, sometimes it's just encouragement. How many could use some encouragement from God? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, we like that, huh? We like that part. We like the okay, what are you going to do with it? Amen. See, when God encouraged me, he encourages me to pass on the anointing to somebody else. How many say, oh, Lord, I just need to find favor. I'm going to close this uh, statement right here. Is this my second or third closing? Or first closing? Oh, I got two. Jason, you're counting? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You held up two. You're fired. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> I said, but, you know, uh, when, we, when we're seeking love and we, we want that personal relationship, sometimes I hear him give me instructions, uh, but I, sometimes I just feel the anointing. But I got to give that away. Uh, favor uh, that is only for self is misappropriated favor. How many of you remember say that before? Favor is just for you. No, no, no. Solomon is a good example, about the prime example. When God asked him, he says, what can I do for you? He, says, he went to the Lord, and he, said, he says, Lord, give me wisdom that I may guide your people. He said, because you've asked for wisdom and not riches, he said, I'll give you both. Amen. God's looking for the right answer. If Solomon said, no, I want riches and, 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 and give me a, a, a big kingdom, I want a, a good army, I, you know, all this other stuff, and God was, uh, said, okay, that's it, then you wouldn't have wisdom. He would have been a fool like a, a Ahab. Okay, lots of foolish kings that cut off God. But no, he said, because you, you had a, a, the, your main interest, your first part of interest was your call. That's what he was called to do. Build a temple, lead God's people. Because your main interest was the call, I'll give you the rest. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. Where's the first? Now, one thing, the first thing that we need to do, and I mean, we know, we know the scriptures, right? Matthew 5. But the fact is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We want the things first before he added unto you. Okay, if he adds the things unto you, what's he expect you to do with them? Use it to bless somebody else. Well, wait a minute, if, I, if he gives me something, if I give it away uh, to bless somebody else, I won't have it anymore. Uh -uh. 
wrong. You don't understand the principle of God. You give way to get. Amen. And he fills up more. The reason some of you are, are, are probably uh, strapped, maybe, I don't know. You ask, you go before the Lord. Maybe you're strapped because basically you have it, you hung on to it instead of giving it to God or, or, or distributing it so he can bless you more. Yeah. I don't know. I can't hear God when it comes to giving. Well, try giving the way he said to do it. Amen. And I guarantee you'll hear from him. Amen. Can you hear the word this morning? Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening. For all those at home, thank you for listening this morning. And, and uh, praise the Lord. I hope you got something out of the message this morning that you can apply practically. One of the things I used to dislike in church and religion is they preach and preach and preach and never say anything that was applicable for, for uh, life. I just gave you se- several things right now that you can apply to your life. All right. How many is going to go home and, and search that one thing? And it's not your husband or your wife. So forget it. It's not somebody else. It's you. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Thank you for for listening this morning. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet and end with prayer. And um, hallelujah. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We come before you and we thank you, Lord. Uh, uh, Those that have questions about you speaking to their heart, Father, make yourself known right now in the name of Jesus. For those, Father, that have never... Uh, made Jesus a uh, Lord of their life or Savior, uh, let them, Father, God, commit now in the name of Jesus. Just committing their hearts to the service of the Lord, committing them, and let Him direct your paths in the name of Jesus. God will direct as a response to our faith and our ability to go seek Him. Seek Him. Seeking is a response. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. An empowerment upon your people to not survive in these last days, but to live. The church needs to get out of survival mode and to get into really living the abundant life. I think Jesus said abundant life. The abundant life is not surviving. The abundant life is having enough to give away. Having enough of your life to give to somebody else to benefit somebody else. Praise the Lord. If you're in survival mode, maybe because your background or where you come from, whatever, and you just you know, get a hold all you can to hang on to it, then basically you're missing the boat because God was gonna, will open up and the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you cannot contain, but the window stays locked as long as we stay locked. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. All those that are suffering from sicknesses and diseases, uh, for, from cancers, from whatever it is, uh, uh, afflictions, uh, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, a, a total deliverance, healing, miracles, Father God, where miracles are needed. We believe you for miracles in the name of Jesus, Father God, that all be healed. And, and, and give testimony to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody in Covenant Word Church said, Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.